Hey, everybody. And we are back. Yeah. This is a good one. That I can't remember who um, re who uh, requested this one or, or at least suggested it to me. It may have been Louie. He was talking about, you know, watching Cocaine Cowboys. And uh, we went, Jenny and I went ahead and watched this. When did we, see, what, what day did we see this? Probably about a week ago? No, it wasn't that long ago. Long? It was just like a couple, uh, it was just a couple days ago. A couple days ago? All right. It seemed like a long time ago now. That we saw it. it was a good series. Yeah. Well, what's it was something I didn't know. So this was actually made by um, a dude, like a documentarian named Billy Corbin. Now, prior to this, he had actually made three sort of standalone documentaries. Yeah. Um, also called Cocaine Cowboys. Like, I think the first one came back like way, like came out way back in 2006. So I haven't seen any of those, but... This is the new one on Netflix. Yeah, this is the new one on Netflix, which is like a six-part series. Yeah. That one, the... the um, the ones that he did before didn't really cover this tale. Uh, you know, these two guys in particular, it kind of covered some other, other guys that shit that was going on too. But I haven't seen those, but I've heard those are really good. So, you know, the I guess the dude's from Miami and that's kind of his specialty for doing the yeah. documentary. So he's the one that did this one. Yeah, you can see it on Netflix right now. It's it's it's, it's a great series. It's about these, these two guys who ended up just becoming the damn kings of Miami. This series is uh, fucking Florida as fuck. It All is, right. yeah. This is like, uh, <laughs> this is, you know, this is these are, these two guys are kind of like the real Scarface. You know, Scarface was something out of fucking Hollywood. This is the real deal. This is how they really lived. This is uh, who the guys really were. And they were just young dudes in their 20s. They were second generation Cuban, Cuban uh, Americans. And uh, cocaine was illegal, but it wasn't that illegal back then. You, you know what I mean? You had to... You had to really be abusing uh, uh, the fucking cocaine to get serious, serious time for it when they started. You know, um, I mean, in California almost treated it almost like it was legal back at, around this time in the seventies. But it wasn't until the war on drugs hit that it became that that you could do serious time for it. But these two guys, fucking, they saw co cocaine as their way into the American dream. And well, it worked got, for a while. <laughs> they got for a while. They got fucking huge. They did it for a long time. They had a very organized little company uh, between them and their friends, and they had a lot of fun in the clubs around here. Built a lot of shit, and did a whole bunch of fucking boat racing, speed boat racing, and they were all over the fucking television. They were televising their speed boat races and everything, and these dudes were making like millions and millions of dollars a month. Yeah. With needing to have jobs. Nobody asked any questions. <laughs> and uh, this movie, prior to this, on other shows, you know, I was making, you know, we live in Florida, I live in Orlando, and I'd be joking around saying that the Miami skyline was built on cocaine. I wasn't joking. This is about that era. Yeah. All right. That building that fell down a couple months back was like from this era. It was being built with this kind of drug money. All right. And uh, it was just another time, man. <laughs> and, well, uh, I mean, they there were so much. They brought in so much drug money yeah. that it also. I mean, you know, I guess that's bad, but it's like in a way, it like really helps the economy. It because, built Florida. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you got to think it's not just like, you know, they, it's all these people with money suddenly. And it's like, but they, you know, they, they need groceries and cars and shit yeah. like that. So it's like it kind of. They jump started the economy. Yeah. That caused the growth of uh, of Florida. It's not as bad as it was, evidently, but who knows? Because everybody was involved. The elected officials were involved. Fucking everybody was Well, they kind of go into this. Yeah. I really liked this series because even though it's about drug dealers and they did some really, really shady shit, uh, up to and including maybe, allegedly, having a bunch of people bumped off. Yeah. Um, but that said, I like that this kind of, this series kind of like toes the line between, it's actually like really entertaining. Yeah, it's funny. And and funny and goes into yeah. a lot of the shit that was going on behind the scenes like with them. Because they got caught a few times, but they somehow like most of the time managed to wangle their way out. Yeah, they'd be in prison and all of a sudden they'd find out that they got released. Who released us? We don't know. 
They just got yeah, released. Yeah, because they had all these, like, connections. They, they could bribe any policeman. They could do whatever. They had but millions then, of millions Yeah, of but then, like, on the other side, you almost kind of, like, want to admire them because it was yeah. just two guys, one of whom was, like, pretty smart, and the other one, yeah. like, a lot of the friends and stuff said, not all that bright. Just a dumb guy. Yeah. But <laughs> and they were just kind of, like, these dudes. And everybody and they liked just, them. They just started yeah. selling Coke, like, back yeah. in the late 70s, like, as a side hustle, essentially. Yeah. And then when the guy that was kind of like the big boss that they were kind of like, you know, because they were small time. Um, what was his name? Jorge Valdez, I think. They yeah. interview him on there, too, and he's a character. He's, like, yeah. super funny. Yeah, yeah. there's nothing as good he's, about this He's series. out of it now. He's, yeah. like, a preacher now, that guy. What makes this series so special is that the guys they're talking about are in this documentary talking about what it was like to do it. Other than the two main guys, yeah, yeah, Willie Falcone and uh, right. Sal Magluta. Are Most of them are out of prison now. Will, yeah. uh, Falcone and the other guy... What's his name? Willie? Sal Magluta. Sal. No. Sal and Falcone, or Willie, Sal and Willie, they're locked up because they were involved in murders. They're, yeah. not get, they're never getting out. Because, yeah, um, well, because what ended up happening, like I said. the rest of them said, are out. Yeah, yeah, because the rest of them, I, I think that Jorge Valdez, like I said, who was sort of like the boss, and he ended up going to prison like in yeah. eight, 1980 or something like that. Yeah. And that was like when Willie and Sal sort of took over his op operation, and they ended up bringing in, what, like 75 tons of cocaine. So yeah. even like cocaine that was like sold in New York and stuff probably came from and LA. them. It built in New York and L.A. also. They were fueling all that. Yeah, it was it was a it, shit ton. Yeah, and they these dudes were... They were fucking big. I mean, you know what I mean? They, The Bee Gees played at their weddings. That kind of shit. They, you know, oh, they my God. Real I, rock I, I, stars. I, I they talk, so hard. They tell all those stories. Um, the Bee Gees played yeah. at one of their weddings. They were on ESPN all the time, racing fucking cigar yeah, boats and shit. Yeah, speed they, boats, but they were right? speedboat racers. They were racers. speedboat fucking champions on ESPN. And, well, didn't, and, isn't that how one of them got caught yeah, at he was one wanted, time because he was on ESPN yeah, yeah. and like a sheriff was like, yeah. hey, I know that guy. Right. That guy's on the most wanted list. And He's on fucking ESPN. Yeah, and it's funny because they didn't see themselves as criminals. They just see themselves as good guys. They were in their 20s having a good time. Yeah, yeah, we're just selling this white stuff. Yeah, snort it. You know, <laughs> yeah. And it was they didn't even have jobs, but they were making millions and millions of dollars. They uh, took care of everybody they knew. They were kind of like a Robin Hood type people. You know, they just paid everybody. They'd give the cops millions of dollars uh, or try to bribe the cops. Let me go and I'll give you everything I got in the truck. You can have it. I know. I'll tell you where a warehouse is where there's billions of dollars. Well, Just I mean, me what and it, would ha it would work. So, what sometime. ended up happening, like what kind of got them into trouble, yeah. like I said, was that, you know, when they finally got busted in what, like the yeah. early 90s or something like that, um, it, they found out later they actually got acquitted. And then when, uh, you know, they started looking into it more, they figured out that they had actually paid off like three of the jurors. And also they had done this little thing where they got their defense attorneys to essentially publish a list of uh, potential witnesses yeah. like in prison magazines and stuff yeah. like that. And then mysteriously, hmm, a bunch of those people turned up dead. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of them survived because one of the dudes, I think what, they tried to get him with a car bomb. Uh, and actually, his wife was driving the car, but she wasn't hurt. She was all right. But um, some of the people absolutely did turn up dead. Yeah. It's, what's funny about these guys is that they were really well liked. Um, they grew up with guys that ended up being cops, too. They went to high school with guys that ended up being cops. Um, they, they went on for probably about 15 or 16 years before they ever fucking uh, resorted to violence. They didn't kill anybody until very late in their careers. They believed that violence just attracted a lot of unwanted attention, and they were, they were right. As long as it was all, everything was being done between friends and nobody killed anybody, and they spent a lot of money and spread money around, they kind of evaded detection. Nobody really wanted them. It wasn't until much later. And when they did want them, it was for little stuff. Like, yeah. What was the one that they, that they wanted to put him in jail for something to do with his passport or having fake IDs? Yeah, well, ideas. they wanted to put him in. I mean, they the thing about it in this, you know, they I, I kind of feel like they knew that these guys were big time drug dealers, were drug yeah. kingpins, essentially. But there wasn't enough evidence to hold them on those charges. So they always try to, like, find other little things like, oh, wait, this guy had like a whole bunch of different like fake driver's licenses. So they're going to try and hold just so they can hold you in prison until they can find evidence yeah. of like bigger shit. But so that's essentially good. they're yeah. pretty good at keeping their fingerprints off of things. Um, it was weird. They just kind of made friends with the main drug dealer 
who was there before him, this other guy who was much older than them. And then they just like, and said, fuck it. They had a friend who was a pilot, and they just decided to buy an airplane, and they just started bringing it in themselves through an airplane. And they were just taking it to an island off the coast of Florida and then just running it from that island uh, to Florida in speedboats. Uh, that's why they were such good, I guess, speedboat racers. They had a bunch of speedboats and shit. <laughs> They're like, hey, we they, could just use this for pull, put, drug yeah, running also. Ton, ton of damn cocaine in the damn boat, you know, and the boat going 100 something miles an hour. It's, uh, but it's an interesting series. Cab Guy said he just looked at uh, Netflix and said it's the number one. Uh, it's at the top of the suggestion list. At, yeah, because it just right it just premiered it's like good. a week or two ago. It's good. It's got good editing. Got a good little theme, you know, theme song in between each episode. Yeah, that Pitbull song. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what's great is uh, all the all the guys in this drug cartel are all free. They're here in Florida. Yeah, because it was a long time it's a long ago. Long time ago. They're all out of jail now, except the two main guys, and that, that was because they they did some murders. But the other guys didn't. And the, their right-hand man was a guy who was much younger than them. He fucking worked out. You can see he kind of fucking did some roids. He's got a real hot fucking blonde Cuban wife. And they even had her... They even gave her a television series. Well, she was on Real Housewives of Miami, I Yeah, think. Real Housewives Wasn't of Miami. Wasn't she on there? I think she was yeah, on there. Yeah, talking about how her husband is no longer involved in that shit, and that they're living Although, wrong. after... They got a shit ton of money. You know? his, that was, uh, his name was his... Because uh, everybody has nicknames on the yeah. show. Um, his nickname was Peggy, P-E-G-Y. Yeah. I think his real name is Pedro. Yeah. But um, Pedro's a real good-looking guy, too. He looks like a male model. But the thing about it, though, yeah. is that after they filmed this series, like yeah. he went to prison again for yeah. some other shit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know they're doing stuff. <laughs> they're doing stuff. But So it's like, even though he's on there, like, talking about, you know, not really want to do it anymore. I can kind of understand it, though. They, yeah. They have all the friends. They have the background. And, the, and, and that's really where they came from. And... Um, they got addicted to living like that. I mean, I, mean, I could see how that would happen. It's like you just yeah. get really used to... Really used to having a million dollars. Being million, having millions of dollars, yeah. not having to worry about anything, and like yeah. living the high life. Everybody loves you. You can go right. into nightclubs, and everybody's kissing your ass. And, and you, you can get, just buy the whole nightclub drinks. Right. And, uh, you know, fucking... They, were, they had a whole bunch of concubines and prostitutes that followed them around, and... The wives tolerated it because they just give the wife, here, here's $100,000, babe, go shop, and it'd be all right. You know what I mean? She could basically do what she wanted, and they everybody just kind of did whatever they wanted. You know, it was a scene. Another one of my favorite characters on here, other than uh, Jorge Valdez, who was, yeah. who was a trip, but also was Sal's uh, girlfriend. Yeah, what yeah. was her Marilyn? I think was her name was Marilyn. Yeah. Oh my God. She, well, she kept the books. Yeah. She, she had like the ledger the together. Yeah. And she was kind of like held shit together, like yeah. when he was in prison. And she is hilarious. She's fucking real hilarious. She yeah. is delightful. Talking about I think how it, Xanax she was taking to try to stay sane. She's fucking. <laughs> she was. She's so afraid fucking of going to prison funny. at any moment. She's you know, so the fucking, fucking funny. The FBI's got everything tapped and. And it just shows uh, how kind of far ahead they were. You know, they were talking to Colombia and talking to places in Cuba and shit on fucking... What was that island that they kept talking to where they were staging the... It was the drop point. Oh, yeah. Uh, I can't remember now. Anyway, they had to have a whole system of fucking shortwave radios so they could communicate clandestinely. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, with all these damn drug depots. They're speaking in code and shit. It's like, it was a sophisticated... Homegrown operation by guys that were high school dropouts. Yeah. When you think about it. Well, see, like I said, there's just goes to show there's lots yeah. of different kinds of intelligence. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of different kinds of intelligence. They were they were uh, geniuses at what they were doing, and uh, a lot of it was social skill and then just imagination. They would imagine some shit and make. They had enough money to make it happen. Yeah, and I mean it helped too that I mean because the thing about it. Is that obviously if you get caught, like, and you you are arrested for you know drug trafficking, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, you're not allowed to use any of the money that you earn drug drug trafficking so to pay you for your defense. Yeah, yeah. However, yeah. somehow I don't think anyone's entirely sure how, but these two guys figured out somehow that. <laughs> Like how to get how to, how to access their money because they must have had some like for like somewhere because they well, froze all their assets. It was all in cash. 
Yeah, so I kind of feel like because they paid yeah. for like this amazing yeah. like defense team. Yeah, everything. Well, th no, the the lawyers basically the the series kind of hints the nod and a wink that the lawyers found ways that they could accept the money. Yeah. Okay, so the lawyers helped them launder that money. Is what what is, yeah. Is what they're saying. They just like I said, I don't think any of them those, wanted to say that right. outright, but I think that was the implication. Which that goes to show you, it's not just Florida. It's just the way courts are. When those lawyers see those dollar signs, they're like, oh, no, no, we need that client. Look at all that money. Yeah. We can't let the cops get that. That money will vanish. we got to channel that through us. We'll pay taxes on it. It'll all be spread around. So they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And, uh, and a bunch of cops were on the take, too. Cops were all on the take. They were helping. Because the cops were like, uh, he got pulled over one time, and, and the cops pulled him over and looked at, looked at him, and he, went, and, and, and he goes, you know who I am. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, just go into Trump. Just take what's in the trunk. And what was in the trunk was, I think, what was it? A half a million dollars? Yeah, I can't I remember that. Yeah. A box of half a million dollars and a bunch of coke. And just take what's in the okay, trunk. Okay, nice doing go. business with and you. the cops went, okay, thank you. And they just took it back. <laughs> so, you know, this is not, Florida's not, th these are Florida men. Florida <laughs> is fucking staffed by Florida men. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same world as it is in other states. It's... I don't know. I kind of feel like this it's kind of shit like goes that everywhere. I think this kind of shit goes on but everywhere. <laughs> the whole southern half of Florida is Central America. It really is. It's an upscale Central America. And that's not a bad thing. It's just that the rules there are different. Um, and who controls it's different. That's that's Cuban territory. Basically, Cubans or, or ethnic style Cuban people, descendants of the Spanish Empire, have been there before the United States ever existed. All right. So people think of these as somehow immigrants from Central America. No, they were here before there was an America. That was Spain. Yeah. You know. True. And they this this is this is uh, how they do things. Um and I am okay with it. They they're doing good. Well, like I said, you I know. don't you know, you you guys know, I'm kind of like more of an advocate of like I don't give a shit with le of legalizing yeah, drugs yeah. Uh, just across the board yeah. uh, because I think it'll make shit generally less dangerous. Yes, um, illegalizing it was actually a power and a money grab. They could make a lot more money off of it if it was illegal. That's yeah. why they did it. So, yeah. like I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that these two guys, I'm not saying they're like heroic or anything like that because they did have people killed. They were entertaining, though. And that's not cool. But this yeah. was like actually a really entertaining, Very entertaining documentary yeah. about them. Yeah. Yeah. Camp guy said, amazing how fast you can run out of money as well. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Tell me about it. Exactly. Um, yeah. He, he says, my wife and I can barely keep a five figure balance in our regular everyday checking account again. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. well, it's just like little, little shit, you know? Well, that's what I was saying. They were addicted to that lifestyle. Um, you know, to them, okay, well, they talked about, they had a bunch of safe houses all around in their territory, just places where they could go, places where they could stash money, stash yeah. drugs, or a place where they could crash, or a place they could take some girl real quick. And, uh, and the crews, you know, it wasn't just the two main guys, it was also all their whole crew could just go to all these little safe houses everywhere. Yeah. And they would forget money in these safe houses, some of those safe houses hidden up in the attics with millions of dollars. Millions. And they'd forget all about it. Yeah, can you imagine just like misplacing a couple yeah. million dollars? Yeah. Well, they, they had more money than they could spend and it was it was difficult to launder the drug money so it would just pile up and pile up. And they didn't own anything. They had to buy things through other people's names, which is hard, which is one of the reasons why it was hard to catch them because they on paper they didn't really own anything. Everything was owned by in-laws and relatives and yeah, and and they and those people kind of had jobs, a lot of them, so they could kind of, kind of, work out a, a thinly veiled fucking camouflage that yeah, this is we own this, but then there was just big, boxes and bundles and bundles of fucking cash everywhere. Yeah, um, there was one story where didn't they one they. They lost a safe house or they sold a safe house and forgot that up in the attic was about a million dollars and the new owner found it. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Wasn't and there was one, on too, the where they so tore like, up the floor and there was like a safe under yeah. the floor and there was a whole bunch of money in there? And then, he, uh, yeah, the one guy, I forgot which one it was. Was it Luis? He was taking a shower. He was somewhere else taking a shower and his mom went through his room. This was in the early days. Went through his closet and they tried to move a big box and the box ripped open and it was like, uh, what was it a million and a half dollars in his closet? And he's an, uh, he's a teenager basically. 
unemployed. He's got about a million dollars in the closet, and then he, it took him a while. He had to explain that. How do you explain that? You know. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. really no reason that a teenager. It's like, yeah. if I was that mom, I'd be like, "You're a drug dealer, aren't yeah. you?" I mean, there's really no other. Yeah. Where the fuck else would you have gotten that? <laughs> You know what I mean? Gramther's Hammer says, is Coke big in the goth party scene? No. 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 Uh, like, do people snort lines of blow in the no. bathroom stalls at mannequins? No. Honestly, I don't really think... No. Cocaine it's, it's never really style. never really seemed yeah. uh, all that big. No. Um, it was only for... That was only for very rich people. Yeah, I feel like that was more an 80s yuppie drug. Yeah. I guess people still do it nowadays. You just don't really hear that much about it. I think most of it gets... Most of it either goes up the noses of very rich people or it gets converted into crack cocaine, and that's just in the hood. Yeah. And you, you never really see that. Um, what you see here would be things like ecstasy, maybe. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like that. it's more uh, that type of thing. Yeah. MDMA. Weed. weed MDMA. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. More like, more like psychedelics. Yeah, it really does seem like that's a lot right. more widespread, at least around here, and at least uh, you know among in, in, people in we scene. know. Yeah. Um. You know, un unless they're doing a bunch of shit and not yeah. saying anything. Weed but... is the most common. You'll see lots of. Lots it is. Of weed. Yeah. There's tons and tons of that. Yeah. That's. You everywhere. can walk down downtown and somebody walk by just whiffs weed <laughs> yeah. smell. It's it's technically still illegal in Florida, but I don't really think it's being that enforced. They don't. Yeah. They, they don't, don't really, really care about seem it. Seem to do much about Florida it. doesn't really, in, in the end, doesn't give a shit. Now, if you had an entire car trunk full of it or a big bag of it and they found, yeah, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. Yeah, I mean, intent to distribute. That's a right. whole other thing. Right. Uh, Oracle said absinthe. You don't see that much either, honestly. Um, absinthe isn't, that's isn't a, it, a drug. It, it's almost kind of like, well, yeah, but I'm just saying yeah. that... Uh, it's just alcohol. Yeah. They do, like, I think mannequins, I think he does have some of it there. Yeah. But it's that's almost kind of more like a special occasion, yeah, type of thing. I feel like it's just. I it's remember just an herbal fucking drink. They're, I remember back in the day, like when we were at venue thirteen. I remember they had like an absinthe party that was like yeah. sponsored by Lucid, yeah, uh, which I don't even know if it's around anymore. I don't know. It was good. That was good stuff though. But it was, um, like, it was just. Yeah, I'm not a big absinthe fan, honestly. It's, it's like just, sambuca. It's or too innocent. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like that. And that's not the way. That's not the way. Um, evidently, uh, absinthe really tasted. Absinthe was issued to like French troops as water purification, and they kind of got a taste for it in the Napoleonic Wars, and and other colonial wars that were going on. And they were mixing it with water and sugar and weird shit like that. It, there was really nothing to it. It just kind of like a health drink. And then there was all this stuff about oh well, it'll get you high, it'll make you hallucinate. That was the wine industry that that claimed that. They were losing ground to absinthe companies. Yeah, so, so they, they wanted to say that yeah. it was like some kind of The wine industry paid, paid for black propaganda or black press in the French newspapers that absinthe was dangerous, but it wasn't. It was. I mean, it's just... It's like chartreuse. Yeah, it's just it's alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, I have like I have a couple of books back there about like yeah. the history of absinthe. It's actually like really really fascinating, yeah. and around like kind of about the whole like culture surrounding it as well. Yeah, like, well, you know, I mean, like you know, absinthe might have been dangerous because the same dudes that were drinking absinthe were also fucking drinking laudanum, and fucking doing things like fucking yeah. shooting morphine. I, I kind of feel like that's probably yeah. What it was. So it's drinking, like don't don't blame the absinthe. It wasn't the absinthe. <laughs> it might have had to do with the damn morphine that they were taking and the fucking cocaine that they were drinking. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like that was probably more of a problem right. than like it was that. It's in the same place. <laughs> alcohol was. Yeah. And it's just like funny that, well, like you said, I you know, the the whole thing about, you know, Green Fairy and hallucinating and stuff like that, that was mostly uh, the wine industry that, wine industry that came up with that. Trying to make absence seem like, like you said, it was dangerous or it was only like drunk by degenerates or yeah. something like that because they were losing market share. Yeah. Because there was a time when absence was like massively, massively popular. Yeah, and it was putting out. It was putting out the went the French wine companies that had been around for a fucking hundred years and they were huge because the French fucking drank wine like crazy and that was a huge industry and they just and, and they had been there for a long time and they had their fingers in the in the damn legal system and everything you know so to protect the wine companies they went after absinthe but there's nothing special about absinthe not really no nope. and somebody's asked about Jägermeister same shit there's nothing special about that it's just alcohol with herbal flavors in it yeah that's all it is Oracle says, a friend of mine who's a novelist drinks absinthe occasionally, but she admits it's part of her Victorian fetish. Yeah. I, I like all the imagery surrounding it. Yeah. You know, like I said, I even designed like a board game 
called The Green Hour that was kind of like about all of that, like all the old uh, absinthe bars like back from Paris and stuff back in the day. So I like all the cultural shit surrounding it, but I don't really... I don't really like the taste of it particularly, though. I don't. No. I don't like that anise flavor. Well, evidently, that wasn't in the original one. It was well, supposed, yeah, to, be, it was supposed yeah. to be buttery. It had a buttery Which flavor. Which I, yeah, I would like that better. Some people say it was more like a chartreuse flavor. Yeah, which you know, I, I could do that. But no. I, like I said, I'm not real into. Only copies of it survive. There was a, a um, and it's all just based upon rumor what it tasted like. There were no. It was a proprietary uh, recipe like Coca Cola. And anybody can make a cola, but was that the original Coca-Cola? No. The original Coca-Cola doesn't even taste like Coca-Cola of today. There's the, the recipe's out there from the 1800s. People have done it, and they go, oh, yeah, that's good, but it's not a Coca-Cola. Yeah. Yeah, you can make it. The original recipe's out there, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be marketable. Last Avenger 85 says, didn't Van Gogh cut his ear off by drinking too much absinthe? No. Um, no. No. I Honestly, he had other problems. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was a drunk. Yeah, and he drank absinthe too. But like I said. And he had mental problems also. That's, that's come from the fucking French propaganda of the time, man. Yeah, I don't think it was the, just the absinthe. It wasn't the absinthe. And it honestly, was all the damn morphine. Honestly, <laughs> if you drank enough of anything, you yeah, do stupid you shit. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be absent. It could be anything. Those same people were fucking doing things like injecting morphine and drinking cocaine that had been dissolved in fucking wine. They did all kinds of drugs. People think that a lot, that, that there were no drugs, that drugs are a new phenomenon. <laughs> Fuck no. The 1800s was fucking just drug addled. I'm like did. surprised that yeah. people lived as long as yeah. they did. I mean, they didn't live as long as nowadays, no. but I would have thought they'd have dropped dead before yep. they were thirty. You could just go to a store. The and buy, shit they were doing. You could just go to a store and buy a gigantic <laughs> jar of cocaine for like nothing. Well, it was legal. It was legal. You could go buy a big fucking big bottle of fucking laudanum, which was morphine, yeah. basically. And you could drink it or you could inject it. You could do whatever you wanted. But they usually they drank laudanum, and that was supposed to be just. Cough medicine, like a cure-all. If you felt bad, drink this. You'll feel better. They sat around drinking that shit all day long. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really get. Like I said, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. That's it, why. Yes. That's why Pepsi pepped you up. It was had cocaine <laughs> in it. So people have a fucking very skewed. Victorian concept. Seriously, I read a book a while back too that's all about the history of like sodas. Yeah. And almost all of them were started. I mean, the whole thing of like soft drinks, what they all started out as like medicines. Yeah. So a lot of them did have drugs in them. Yeah. Like back in the day. What got people fucking sober, really? Uh, uh, what got Europe off of taking all that fucking morphine and laudanum and cocaine and all that alcohol? What what got them to kind of stop that was coffee, because yeah. coffee came and that was a safe alternative because the water was boiled. Yeah, uh, they drank alcohol and drank these drugs because they were clean. You couldn't drink water out of the tap; it was fucking contaminated back then. Yeah, so you had to drink something that was water like, a liquid like <laughs> water <substance>. adjacent. <laughs> and uh, so they were mostly high or drunk because of what they were drinking. The safe shit was all some kind of drug. But then coffee came, coffee and tea. Yeah, from like the Middle East. Yeah, and uh, those were safer alternatives that wouldn't really fuck you up. So kind of like the whole, this whole concept of not being constantly high or drunk is a product of the the advent of coffee. Yeah, that's like yeah. And, and fucking and, and tea. Before then, everybody was fucked up all the time. Yeah. It was very well, rare that I can't really blame up. them because it's like, you know, if you'd have lived back then, you'd probably want to yeah. be fucked up all the time, too. They lived in poverty, most of them, so they didn't right. even it's get like much to eat. Horrible so. conditions. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, what else are you going to do? You yeah. could get like booze and shit for yeah. really cheap or drugs. A poor person back then, nutrition was a couple pints of beer and a piece of bread. Yep. You were lucky if it had butter on it. Yep. And that's They lived off that. Yep. So, yeah, most people did. Yeah, that's why they looked fucked up, the poor people. <laughs> didn't have any fucking muscle mass or anything. Didn't live long. Teeth fell out early. Really bad nutrition. And uh, their only way to fucking kind of stay, you know, make themselves feel decent after all that fucking deprivation is just fucking drink laudanum. Drink a bunch of cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, in Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I, I, you know, like I said, I have a couple of histories of absinthe and soda and stuff like that because that's like something that's really interesting. I also have like two or three books that are a history of coffee, yeah. Yeah. and it kind of goes into that too yeah. because they started drinking coffee and then they started to get a little more intellectual. Yeah, because like I said, there's a whole coffee house culture. That's yeah. where a lot of like the Enlightenment kind of shake. Yeah, know, sitting came around from and drinking and, coffee, reading and talking and fucking talking about politics. And, hey, we gotta stop. Yeah, because everyone was everyone wasn't drunk. And yeah, fucked up all we gotta start stuff fixing for shit. the first time ever. Right. <laughs> And that had to do with a lot of solving a lot oh of problems. Oh my god, I'm problems. sober. Yeah. <laughs> this feels really strange. Maybe we ought to build <laughs> clean water systems in the cities so people don't have to fucking drink water that has rotten eels in it. Right, shit. exactly. You turn on a spit, spigot, and fucking rotten eel parts would come out because it was just infested with eels. Yeah. Well, all kinds of shit people don't realize. Yeah. They fucking parts of the water systems of these major city, European cities that get fucking clogged up and it tastes in putrid. The whole fucking half the damn city complaining about it. They try to figure out what the problem is and there'd just be a big rotten ball of hundreds of fucking eels clogging up a main line somewhere. Yeah. Because it was just infested with eels. Oracle said, actually, that reminds me of something I heard about Chinese railroad, railroad workers. They were less prone to waterborne disease because they rarely drank unboiled water. Because yeah. they usually had, like, tea or... Tea, coffee. If they couldn't get tea, that they would just yeah. drink, like, hot water, like, boiled yeah. water. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you, I was talking to Saad, you know, he's in Saudi Arabia, you know, and being, being from an Islamic background, they're very suspicious of alcohol use. And I just had to explain to him, I said, without alcohol, there would have been no Europe because the population would have fucking plummeted down to nothing because there was just no clean water supply, not in the cities. It would have gone back to, it would have been an apocalypse. It had gone right back to, to the rural life. Uh, for popul To have population density with the way it was back then, and we're talking, you know, the periods of 13, 13 to 15 to 1600s around that time, you had to have alcohol. Especially distilled alcohol was the best. Because they would just get a bunch of fucking filthy water out of the damn tap, pour some whiskey in it to try to purify it, and they drink that. <laughs> Think of that. I know. That was their that was their water sanitation was just pouring hey, whiskey. Better than nothing. <laughs> pouring whiskey into the into the filthy water so you could drink it <laughs> with rotten eel juice in it oh and sewage. Because yeah, people had no problem with throwing a bucket of piss into the fucking water supply. That'd be all right. It's just water. Yeah, it, it really seemed, like I said, if you guys haven't read, there's a really great book. I have it back there on the shelves. It's called The Ghost Map. Yeah. And it's about them discovering uh, what caused waterborne illnesses. And like yeah. you said, prior to the really the end of the 1800s, they didn't really have any concept of let's not like just Piss shit in water in the water and supply. have like just these big pools yeah. of shit and piss yeah. in this place and then like have the water yeah. spigot right by it so it's like leaching yeah. into the water table yeah. and it's like everyone's like gee I wonder why everyone's getting sick right well, but it's like now it's like duh but right. back then they didn't really no water for purification and when the guy when one doctor like kind of in the, it was, yeah, the they he, couldn't was, believe he it. was in London and he came yeah. and said you know maybe there's these little like microorganisms he didn't call them that obviously but he's like maybe there's little things in the water that we can't see they're making us sick um they and everyone everyone thought he was crazy because yeah. everybody thought that it was the air yeah that it was like Smells. stinky air stinky air got was like sick. making you sick miasma and that they called it uh-huh yeah yeah, well, I mean, it stands to reason because you know, yeah, if the if the if you you know the water's fucked up, it's gonna stink, and yeah, everybody's getting sick. But so everybody thinks that the stink is causing the sick, but it's not. It's actually the water. But because you can't see, you know, you can't see the microorganisms that are in the water. Yeah. Then you know they they just thought he was like making it up. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it, it says I think our modern water and health departments are some of them some of the most hard to imagine wonders of the first world. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You take clean water for granted. That wasn't a, that was that's a, a recent <laughs> invention. Yeah. Is to be in a city and have clean water. Yeah, and yeah. not like not even Yeah. European you, city. You don't even really have to think about it. No. And honestly, now like if we have a storm or something and it like messes up the water pipes and you have to boil your water for like a couple days, people freak the fuck out. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy crap. It's like, yeah. you know, they'll fix it. It's not like the fucking Middle Ages where it's like the water is just full of poop. Yeah. Jeez, calm down. <laughs> it's not yeah. that big a deal. 
All right, so I think that probably covers it with Cocaine Cowboys, huh? Yeah, definitely. If you're interested in South Florida at all, um, like I said, I haven't seen his, because he made three documentaries about this, like, prior, going back to 2006, which were kind of like, I, I don't think they were standalone. I think it was, like, a series, but he made them, like, a few years apart. Uh, but, yeah, so this is, like, a six- a six part series it's yeah. like it's, so it's about five or six another, hours another long. thing is good about this series it shows people not only in america but also cause a lot of people in america don't even realize this but it shows people outside the united states how local american government really is yeah when you think of fucking the american government you're thinking of washington dc washington dc has nothing to do with what's going on on the ground in most of these places in the united states you watch this and you will see that really this was a miami thing yeah. My, and, and Miami was kind of a small town when this was happening. Yeah. I mean, it's and, a massive city, but the scene where it was taking place was, was kind of a like small a small, area. yeah. And you, would, and you just see how local government actually is. Government is a local phenomenon. If you have a lot of friends in your local government and your local police, and you have enough money and you've greased enough palms, you can evade even federal law enforcement. Yeah. And that's, the FBI was after him. You know, and it took them a long time to get them, both of them. Yeah. They were after a lot. And they actually had a good survival strategy. No, they didn't want any of this fucking public murder or wholesale slaughter that some of the other drug groups were doing. So the priority was to catch the violent ones. Yeah. So all the federal guys really, they knew about these Falcone and the other dudes, but they were kind of... They weren't killing anybody, so the priority was on the smaller groups. Well, and rightfully, rightfully so. Trying to, they had to mop them up first. Well, they'd mop them up, and they'd quickly replace by some other violent guys. So they were constantly in the background as kind of being the low priority target. Even but they though were they were making all the money, even though. though they were bringing in billions and billions they were the ones that were making all the money. Yeah. Actually, they even said, like, the Wikipedia page, I think, of theirs uh, said that um, 75 tons of cocaine, but yeah. the the guys on there, like Jorge Valdez and stuff, he's like, it was more like 175 tons. He's like, I don't yeah. think they got it all, or they didn't, yeah. like, know how much it was. So he's, like, saying he thought it was, like, way more than the than the estimates. Yeah, but they're colorful characters, and uh, they're there in that series, and it's funny to hear their sides of the stories. Talking about, you know, being a drug dealer... It's a very stressful life. You're constantly worried. You're very stressful. You're constantly good. We had money, but you know, kind of the money's not all that. We had unlimited money, but it, but you're constantly worrying. You know. That's the thing about yeah. it. It's like because I kind of like every time I watch these kind of series, yeah. I'm always just kind of like, man, maybe maybe I should be a drug dealer. But then I was just kind of I mean, look you, at all the money. But the you'd thing never of, get a night's sleep. Yeah, you would never. You would constantly be worried when you're doing illegal shit like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure like having billions of dollars is nice, but you can't ever really enjoy it. I mean, and it's not just that the law might come down on your ass. It's that like somebody else might fucking pop you. Another thing that was funny is that is is just the unlimited greed. Because they, yeah. they had been doing this for 10 years at one point. They could have just and got one, out. And one of the lieutenants was like, dude, you have a hundred and, you have over $100 million. And he goes, why don't you just walk away? He says, you hadn't even been arrested. You just walk yeah. away. You can just walk away from it now. And he thought about it for a second. He goes, when I hit a billion, I will. When I hit a billion. See, that's what so, gets you in trouble. Yeah, yeah, when I hit a billion, I'll walk away. I mean, if I had a like, hundred million dollars, I'd be like, right okay, now. I'm good. And I, hadn't been, and I hadn't gotten caught yeah. and nobody had bumped me off or anything. Right. I'd be like, okay, I'm awesome. I'm just going to go he had, retire to some yeah. island somewhere and change my name and they, just live out the rest of my life. They had dozens of fucking houses, dozens of safe houses, or dozens of safe houses, several mansions, a shit ton of boats, a whole fleet of fucking luxury cars. And a hundred million dollars in cash, and he and he could have just walked away, and 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 just gone quietly into the night. He, he and his he and his brother, and they said we'll, we'll do that when we hit a billion, as if a hundred million is. But I think a hundred million is a hundred million enough. doesn't seem like a lot when you're spending a million a month. I guess. I guess I can't imagine what that a, must be like. So. They were spending a million a month in clubs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. really. <laughs> you'd think after a while you'd just kind of get sick of doing that and yeah. you'd be like alright well I'm just going to save some money now yeah. I don't know but yeah but it's really entertaining though yeah, really like this, entertaining series, it man. was I had heard of these two guys because like I said I'm from you know I grew up in Florida my whole life um, I'm not from Miami but uh, you know you kind of heard about it second hand uh, but I didn't know like kind of all the shit about yeah. the shit they were doing like fucking with the jury and all that other kind of stuff so that was like so it's like really really interesting and it was kind of like I said it's 
it's kind of interesting how they, uh, and a little bit inspiring how just these two guys just kind of yeah. worked their way up like From that. Nothing, yeah. Like I said, it's the American dream in some fucked up kind of way. But then like how they evaded the police. But like I said, it, you know, it, it's just like a really interesting kind yeah, of they're, they're behind sorry. bars for life now, though. They should have quit while they were ahead. Well, and uh, wasn't one of the, I think, um, wasn't Willie's brother, cousin, something like that? Like, wasn't he on the lam for like 25 years and they only just recently caught him like yeah. a year or two ago? Yeah. But, but the dumb thing was that he didn't go any place. He was like still he in. Right, yeah. That's he was, he was like in Kissimmee or something, yeah, which another, is like right by Disney World. In case another funny thing is that they would be wanted for these charges. Now, most of these offenses, they probably would have only done 18 months to five years, but they just did not want to go to jail. But they wouldn't run either. They would stay right here in Florida. Yeah, they didn't the go shit they would Which run. I guess you can go anywhere. Yeah. You could go anywhere. You yeah. could go somewhere that doesn't have extradition. They didn't like to leave Florida, Florida. Florida. They really didn't like to. South Florida was their homeland, and they did not. That was their ethnic homeland, and they did not want to leave. Yeah. Well, because like yeah. I said, when they finally tracked down Willie's, I can't. Yeah. I can't remember if it was his brother. He was like involved too, but he was on like the most wanted list for yeah. like 20, 25 years, something like that. He was on the lam, and when they ended up arresting him, he was just right. He was right down the street from yeah. here. He was like he was like twenty miles from here in Kissimmee. Yeah, just living in a regular ass house. Yeah, and they just never found him after all that time. It's like they finally <laughs> busted him. Yeah, just but see the series is pretty good. Yeah, it is really good. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll be back tomorrow talking about another uh, series. Actually, we'll probably do that other series tomorrow if we finish it tonight because we found another really good series on Netflix. I don't know how long it's been on there, but it's uh, really, really good. Yeah, the Japanese one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it called? It's called Battle for Japan. The Age of Samurai. The Age of Samurai, Battle, Battle of Japan. Battle Check that one Japan. out, too. It's yeah. kind of like, it's about the history of the fucking... The samurai and how they how the samurai daimyo fucking warlords were fighting each other, and all the major names and its reenactments really good fucking great great um, uh, animations in between. Yeah, the it's scenes. beautiful looking. It's really beautiful cool looking. looking. Really cool. It's kind of like Game of Thrones, but a documentary. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So yeah, we'll probably be talking yeah. about that tomorrow. I think we have. I think that's also six parts. Um, what I think we watched like the first four first parts. First season. Yeah. And uh, so we need to watch like the last two tonight and then we'll talk about it tomorrow. Yeah. But that's really good, too. So, uh, yeah. So have a good rest of your weekend, everybody. And uh, we'll see you guys again tomorrow.